Well, if there are two words that every believer would love to hear when God calls them home, is it's this, well done. Those two simple words describe the one who would hear them as faithful. There are many examples of faithfulness in the Bible. I think of Noah. He was faithful to complete the ark despite being ridiculed. I don't know about you, I think I might want to quit. Rain? Sure, Noah. What's rain? Never saw that before, but go ahead and build your boat, whatever. But he was faithful to complete it because God gave him the task to do it. I think of Moses. He was faithful to lead God's children out of Pharaoh's bondage despite personal struggles and outside opposition. I think we can all safely say that if we were in Moses' sandals, we'd probably want to quit. But yet he was faithful. I think of David being faithful to fill his role as both shepherd and king despite personal struggles and sinfulness. Yet he did what God asked him to do. And though he was not perfect, though he sinned, when confronted, he repented. And God said he was a man of my own heart. When I think of people like Ruth being faithful through her, to her family, though her family life fell apart, she was faithful to God. There are others who were characterized by faithfulness like Daniel, Job, Joseph, and others that would come to your mind. Abraham, people who characterize faithfulness in their life. What if that was our character? What if that would be said of us and our reputation that they were faithful? I think the book of First Timothy is such a book that encourages its readers to be faithful. It especially encourages the church to be faithful. As we begin to dive into the book, we're going to see the church being challenged to be faithful in three specific areas in chapter 1 concerning its message. First, the church needs to be faithful in its doctrinal teaching. Secondly, the church needs to be faithful in its proclamation of the gospel. And lastly, the church needs to be faithful in the defense of its faith. God is calling us as the church of Jesus Christ to be faithful. I don't know about you, but I know that there's a million reasons as to why we could quit or maybe even should quit, or maybe even want to quit. But God is not calling us to quit. He's calling us as the church of Jesus Christ to press forward and to be faithful. And this was the message that Paul gave to young Timothy in the faith. As one of his spiritual fathers, he challenged Timothy as he worked with the church, urged them to be faithful, urged them to not quit. And if I could say that to us today, I would say this to myself. I would say this to all of us who are sitting here today. Don't quit. There's too much at stake. There's too much of an urgency in the day where we live that we cannot quit now. Remain faithful. So we're going to be looking at this, and we're going to look at today at verses 1 through 11, along with some other passages that reinforce what we're being taught in 1 Timothy here. Um, but if you would, follow, or just let's all have a moment of prayer as we... Uh, get started in this book this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for the opportunity we have to be here, Lord. We've been oper- had the opportunity, Lord, to worship through music, and Lord, to sing to you, to sing about you, to, Lord, uh, exalt you through music. But Lord, I pray now that as we worship you with the word, that we would, with the same vigor, with the same anticipation, with the same excitement and energy, Lord, look to your word that there's going to be something that we hear that applies to our lives. Something that we need to do in light of what we've heard. And I pray, God, that you would impress that upon our hearts this morning. So, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this morning I want to begin by reading 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1-11. through 11. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. To Timothy, a true son in the faith... Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some having strayed have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. 
knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. The first thing that we see right off the bat in verses 1 and 2 is Paul's greeting. He's an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ our hope. The first thing I want you to see is that he was an apostle. There are a lot of people who claim to be apostles, but really an apostle by definition is someone who walked with Jesus Christ. He was one who was there. He was taught. He was saw. He observed firsthand from his Lord, from his Savior. And he was he had the ability to be the apostle. And as he was talking with young Timothy, he's imparting unto him the faith. But not only that, we see that he was commissioned by the giver of hope. Now think about that just for a moment. We, we've talked about this on different levels many times. But the reality is this. We have a hope, an anchor, as the hymn says, that is sure, that is steadfast, that will never change. And the reality is this. You may hope that one day you have a nicer car. You may hope that you have a bigger house. You may hope that you have a windfall of financial income. And those things are not sure. Those things are not concrete. Those things may never happen. But the hope that we have in Jesus Christ, that is concrete evidence. Concrete in the fact that if he says it, it's going to happen. So the reality is that our hope, and it says here, he is the giver. Because this message, this commandment of God our Savior from our Lord Jesus Christ, our hope, to Timothy, a true son in the faith. So his greeting is as an apostle of Jesus Christ, one who, is com- who walked with Christ, commissioned by the giver of hope to give this message to Timothy. Now, as we bring Timothy into the picture, he first of all says he's a true son in the faith. What makes Timothy a true son in the faith? Well, I think we see at least four things here, and I think they're pretty interesting things. So if you would take your Bibles and turn to Acts chapter 16. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and chapter 16. I want to look at the first five verses here when we see some characteristics about the life of Timothy. Paul says he's a true son in the faith. First of all, he says, Then he came to Derbe and Lystra, and behold, a a certain disciple there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. So here's his disciple. He's recognized. He's well spoken of. And what is he doing there? Paul wanted to have him go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders of Jerusalem. So here he is. He has a heart for the gospel. He has a heart for the word of God. And he's along with Paul going along these cities, giving the decrees that they were to have learned, that they were to hold fast to. So, verse 5, I think is interesting here. So the churches were strengthened in faith and increased in number daily. See, the first thing that you want to see about Timothy is that not, not only the testimony, the reputation that he has being true son in the faith, he was one who was concerned about the gospel. He was mission-minded. And as he went about giving those decrees that Paul had taught him, the churches were being strengthened, and the gospel was going forth in, in, the, in, in such a way that the churches were growing. We read, read over again in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18. The second thing about Timothy, and we see in verse 18, it says, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. I think Timothy, as he was growing, he was realizing that this is not an easy task. And we're going to see that in just a moment. This is not an easy commission that he was called to. It's warfare. And if you don't believe that, something's not right in our minds and the way we're thinking. Because the world that we live in, I'm telling you, it's warfare, is it not? Look what's going on on the news. I, I get caught up in it some days, and the next day I'm like, I don't want anything to do with it because I, I just get irritated over it. The fighting, the bickering, the Democrats, the Republicans, the this, the that, the who, the, you know, it gets overwhelming. It's warfare. There is a world that is against Christianity. There is a world who says, I'm going to do what I want. I don't care what the Bible says. But can I just tell you, do we expect anything different? That's the world we live in. It is warfare. And we need to stand up for what we know is right. And so he says the churches there were strengthened in faith. And then he comes over here and he says, 
to the prophecies previously made concerning you that by them you may wage the good warfare. Listen, churches are going to grow. They're going to have to grow because it is going to be difficult. And there is strength in numbers. So they were growing. And uh, there's a warfare going on. Then number three, we see another characteristic about Timothy and why Paul called him a true son in the faith. And we find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. So Romans, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 says, For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Obviously, in order for Timothy to teach what was right, he had to be a student of the Word. He had to be someone who had, been commi had committed himself to learning what was right so that he could impart that truth to the churches. And then number four, we see one more characteristic about Timothy. Uh, he was cared for by God's people. And you see that in Philippians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, uh, chapter 2, verses 20 and following here. 2.20 says this. Actually, it says, For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. So as he's talking about this here, we see over and over his testimony, his reputation, his character is that he was mission-minded. He had a care for the church. He was chosen for the ministry. He was faithful to his Lord. And he cared for God's people very carefully. What is our reputation when it comes to being part of the church of Christ? Now, I'm not talking about all of us as a whole, although that's important too. I'm talking about all of us as individuals. If we are going to make an impact in this world that we live in, and remember, the church is not these four walls, is it? Right? We know that the church is not this building, right? The church is who? You and I, who have placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So the church goes to work every day. The church goes to the grocery store. The church... He talks to the neighbor next door. The church is involved at school. See, the church is about out and about, right? So what is our testimony as a church person, as someone who's given their life to Christ, as somebody who says, I put my faith and trust in Him, what is our reputation? Are we mission-minded? Are we careful to be faithful to the Lord in all the areas of being a part of this local assembly? Are we one who cares for the people of God, as Timothy did? Yes, Timothy may have had a different title, a different position, but he was a member of the body of Christ. And the key here is that he was faithful. But not only that, he was a spiritual leader that faced discouragement. Uh, have you ever faced discouragement? You ever, you ever been discouraged? Well, I, I think Timothy did. I, th I think he faced a lot of discouragement. How do I know that? I think there are just three passages that just blurted out big time. And first of all, we see that right away in our text in, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. Chapter 1, verse 3 says, As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some of them that they teach no other doctrine. Well, why would Paul tell him to stay someplace that he already was? Could it possibly be that he was maybe considering leaving? I think we see that from other texts that go along with this that there's the possibility that he said, man, I, I, I've had enough of this. They're not listening. They're not applying what we are teaching. They're not taking it to heart and really, you know, realizing the urgency of this message. He says, don't quit. Don't leave. I want you to stay in Ephesus and complete the task that you've been charged with. You ever felt like quitting? I know I have. I say, not you. Yeah, I've lost. I think every one of us. Right? There are times that we just say, I've had enough. I don't care where you work. I don't care what you do. There's going to be times that you just say, I have had enough. But don't quit before God tells you to. Don't leave before God makes it clear that you're to leave. Finish the task that you've been charged with. And I think that's the first thing that Paul was reminding young Timothy. He says, as I urge you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. And then over in chapter 5, in verse 23, he says this, No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. So, 
not only as a true son of the faith, but this spiritual leader faced discouragement not only and maybe a desire to leave, but also maybe physically. Maybe physically he just didn't feel good because he had infirmities. How many of us feel like going full blast when you don't feel good? Right? And how many of us have maybe had not just a day of not feeling good or a month of not feeling good, but that part of our life anymore? You know, your back's not getting any younger. Your knees aren't getting any stronger. Your feet hurt. Ever have a reason to quit? I think Timothy said, I feel like quitting. He was encouraged to finish the job. He possibly struggled with physical problems. And I think probably one of the worst things that as a pastor, as a church leader, as a spiritual leader we face is sometimes just personal discouragement. I mean, how often can you preach the message and things not change? How often can you remind somebody to, hey, spend that time with God, it's so important, and they never crack the book? How many times as, you, as a spiritual leader, as a pastor, can you say, we need to be praying about this, and people just go about the day because there's no sense of urgency, no commitment to prayer? I think Timothy faced that. How do I know that? Well, look in chapter 4, verse 12. He says, let no one despise your youth, but be an example of the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Why would he say, don't let no one despise your youth, unless somebody was actually what? Looking down on him. He's nothing. He's just a young man. He doesn't know anything yet. He doesn't have the experience. He doesn't have the wisdom. I can remember being a pastor at 23 years old in Tippecanoe, Indiana. And I remember one of my pastoral friends, he says, okay, don't worry. Just preach every week. They don't listen to you until turn 40 anyway. I think... There's a lot of truth to that. What's this young punk guy up here to say, right? He doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, I always always wondered this in my mind. Why is it that every church that has a youth pastor hires a guy right out of college? He has no experience with teenagers, has no, no, no experience as a father raising a teenager, but he's the youth pastor. I remember thinking, what were they doing when they hired me? They must have, like, not been on, I don't know, functioning on all eight cylinders here. We don't have, we don't know what we're doing. But yet there are those, I believe, who are looking down at Timothy saying, you don't know what you're doing yet. You don't have the experience. You don't have the wisdom. And Paul steps in and says, listen, this is not about you. This is about the word that you're proclaiming. This is about the truth in this, that your truth of who Jesus Christ is that we're standing on. Don't let no one despise your youth. But be an example. You get out there, Timothy, and you be faithful. You don't stop. You don't quit. You just keep going. And over in 2 Timothy, just a few pages over to the right, chapter 2. He says, you, beginning verse 1, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What's he saying here? Don't quit before you have an opportunity to invest in others. But listen to this. He says, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses commit to faithful men. Who's that? Yeah, there you go. You guys are getting it. That's all of us who are faithful. But what are we supposed to do with it when we get it? Who will be able to... What's that word? Teach others. So what are you doing with the information that God's given you? Is it just data? Is it just information? Is it just knowledge? You see, you've been commissioned just as Timothy was commissioned by Paul to teach faithful people who will teach other faithful people who will teach other faithful people. Who are you investing in? He's calling the church to be faithful. Who are you investing in as part of the church of Jesus Christ? You say, well, I teach my kids. That's important. That's a given. That's in Scripture. But beyond that, you see, I personally believe that all of us need a Paul and a Timothy. We, have, we, need, we need a Paul that we can learn from, and we need a Timothy that we can teach. All of us need to be involved in teaching others what we know. So he says, verse 3, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. There's that charge again. You see, the word charge is a military term that has to do with warfare. And here he brings in it again. Endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's not easy. It's not easy. Does anyone have anyone beaten down your doors because they want to learn the Word of God from you in, your, in, your, in the privacy of your home? 
Is anybody that is that happening yet? Right. I, I I don't know. The last time I had somebody knock on my door and say, "Hey, Pastor, I just uh, can you just give me an hour of your time? I I gotta learn something." It's not easy, but we're called to it, and endure the hardship. Because it's going to be difficult. Expect that. And he says, therefore, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Who's enlisted you as a soldier? Jesus Christ. And so he says a soldier wants to please who? The one who has enlisted him. Who are we pleasing? I mean, I'm reading through this. I've been reading through this book in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy for about the last three or four weeks now. And I'm convicted by it. Because as he's talking to the church, and yes, it's Paul impressing his life upon young Timothy, but the message that he's giving is valid for all of us. Why is the church of Jesus Christ falling apart across the nation? Why are churches closing their doors? And yes, they still are. Why is it that so few churches that are starting are having a difficult time getting started? Because we've been focused on the things of this world and been entangled with the things of this life. I truly believe that. All of us have those areas of our life that we say, well, I know God would have us do this, but I'm busy doing this. Someone else will take care of that. Then he brings in the idea of an athlete. If anyone competes as in, in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. And there's a whole set of information and data about the rules that's really interesting. We won't get into all that, but you had to prove before you could compete, you had to prove that you had trained. What are we training for? What is it that we're giving our life to? What is it that occupies our time and our desires? He said, the hardworking farmer must first be partaker of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains. But the word of God is not chained. He said, I may have struggles, but it's not the, the word of God's going to be a go forth with power. Therefore I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. He said there's something greater at stake here. Something far greater than me. So he says here in verse 3 in our text, As I urge you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. So Paul's directive to Timothy we see in verses 3 and 4. We see Paul's greeting. We see Timothy's character. Now we see Paul's directive to Timothy. He says, stay in Ephesus. Stay there. You know, sometimes in life, one of the greatest things we want to do is go, right? I mean, I'm in this job, but I really want to go to this job. I'm in this place, but I really want to go to this place. I have this position, but I really want this position. And it really within our nature, I mean, unless you've just been there forever and you're just kind of satisfied, you kind of want to just that urge to try something new once in a while and get a new haircut, get a new uh, hobby, get a new this, a new that. When sometimes God's saying, stay right there. Don't go there, don't go there, stay there. I think sometimes we leave prematurely. We quit prematurely and we miss the blessing that God has for us. So he says to young Timothy, stay in Ephesus. Charge the church, therefore, to be faithful in their doctrine. And basically he says three things here. Don't teach false doctrines. And it's the idea of teaching wrong doctrines. The idea of teaching different doctrines. Stay faithful to what you know is true. I don't know about you, but I find it really easy to justify what I want to believe. I can make Scripture say whatever I want it to say if I just take that little phrase and it just sounds so good. He says, no, don't do it. Don't give in to a different gospel, a different, a different doctrine. And then he says, don't give heed to fables. Or some of your translations may say myths. It has the idea of things that are untrue. Uh, deceptive gods used to excuse or justify immoral behavior. Did they have them then? Yes, and we have them now. We have things that we can use to justify what we do, what we believe, what we say. 
And he said, get away from those things. He said it very clearly that they teach no other doctrine nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies. The third thing there. Don't give in to endless genealogies. It has the idea of speculative discussion. You ever had that conversation about the what ifs? Well, what if, what, what, if, what, what if this is true? And what if that is true? And what if this is true? And you can what if for hours and hours. I remember sitting in a college classroom talking about what ifs. I mean, we were all of 19 years old and we had the Bible down pat and we knew exactly what election was. I don't think we knew anything. But we thought we did. We talked for hours about it. And why this is right and this is wrong and he's right and she's wrong. Because we had the answers. Why? Because we had discussed it for hours and hours. Only to realize that we don't know nothing. It's an endless genealogy, that speculative discussion. Why? He says the answer to that question. Which cause, what's the word? Disputes. Rather than what? Godly edification. What happens when you get five to seven, ten, two, how many ever number? Somebody who has a different position than you on a theological issue in a room. And you're not going to give and they're not going to give, what happens? Tempers start to flare. Nostrils get flared up a little bit. I'm right, you're wrong. I can prove why I'm right and you're wrong, and you can prove why you're right and I'm wrong. Yep, it's all in there. Cause disputes rather than godly edification. And because of it, he says, this is how it's to be done. Verse 5. Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, from sincere faith. So he gives us several ways. With love. When's the last time we had an argument with somebody where we had a disagreement, but yet they still were convinced that you still loved them? Because you presented it in love. I'm not asking us to agree with them. You can disagree with someone and still love them. Did you know that? In fact, in this world, I think you're going to have to exercise that a lot. Love, but not necessarily agree or accept. There's a difference. But we ought to be able to live in this world, disagree with sinfulness, but still know that they are loved. That's two different things. So he said to do it with love. And then he goes on and says, from a pure heart. I'm not just trying to convince you that you're wrong and I'm right. But I just want you to know the truth. And whether you do with it, that's, I, I can't control the heart, right? Can any of us control the heart? Yes or no? No. You can't control the heart of those that you talk to. Oh, if we could, we would do it. Trust me, we would. As parents, we're going to like do a little tweak there. <laughs> yep. But we can't. What does God's Word say? I was joking with Hans the other day. Foolish, as Mark Lauer used to say in his, one of his early comedy things, he says, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. Yeah, yeah if you could fix it, you would. But how many times have we whooped our children when they were younger and they still had that foolish streak in them? Because you can't change a heart. Only God can do that. So he says, do it with a pure heart. And then he says, with sincerity, a good conscience and sincerity, from a good conscience and from sincere faith. Why? Because we know the end. We know the truth. We have to apply it. Why? Verse 6 gives us the, that answer. From which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk. They made a choice. They made a decision. They strayed, resulting in idle talk or fruitless, endless discussions. And then he goes on to say, some even desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. They don't know. That's why you stick to the truth. That's why you be sincere. That's why you just present truth. And then he says, concerning the law, verses 7 through 10. 
desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners and for unholy and profane and murderers and fathers of murderers and mothers and manslayers and so on and so forth. He said the law is not for those who would be righteous. The law is for those whose heart is wicked and evil and would continue in sin. But we see, this thing, see things here. The law is for the unrighteous. Why? To show them truth. To show them truth. The very fact that you can't keep the law. The law cannot say, but it can reveal who you truly are. In fact, turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2 just for a moment. Just back a few pages. Galatians chapter 2. And I want to read verses, verse 21. It says, I do not set aside the, aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. So if in any way I can become righteous because I follow the law, what do I need God for? What do I need Jesus Christ for? I can do this on my own. I don't need Him. Christ died in vain if I can just follow the rules, follow the law, and it all just fits into place, and boom, got it done. Don't need Jesus. He died in vain. But that's the folly of it. None of us can do that. In fact, he goes on to say, verse 21, So is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the law couldn't give life. See, the law, as we know, cannot say, but it reveals who we truly are because we cannot keep the law. He goes on to say, but the Scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith comes, we were kept under guard by the law, kept, by, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. Some of your translations may say schoolmaster. It taught us. It was a tutor that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under the tutor. He said the law cannot save you, but it can reveal who you truly are because it shows you that you are not capable of doing this yourself. So what's the law for? Not for those who would follow it, but for those who don't because it reveals exactly who you are. And the curse of the law is broken when one puts his or her faith in Jesus Christ. And we see that in chapter 3, verse 10 of Galatians. Verse 10 says this, For as many are, as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. He's been set free. Why? Because of his faith in Jesus Christ. And of course, Romans teaches us that the law's demands are satisfied through what Jesus Christ did, our faith in him. So, this message that Paul has directed Timothy to keep and to give and to stand on with love, with a good conscience, with sincerity is important and we must take the same message and commit it to ourselves. With the glorious gospel as he calls it here in our text. The glorious gospel. Verse 11. Of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. This gospel committed to me is now committed to you. That's what he's saying. In fact, in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20, he says this. O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. What's he saying there? Stand fast in the truth. Guard it. This glorious gospel, guard it with all that you have. And he was reminded of that again in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 14. He said this, That good thing which was committed to you, keep it by the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. How do we do this? With the help of the Holy Spirit. The same message that was given to Timothy is given to us today. The church, to stand fast in the faith. He was to guard it. And as he said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, to share it with other faithful people. Who will share it with other faithful, faithful people. What was Paul's motivation to charge Timothy with this message? I think it was several things just to consider. Number one, 
It's a struggle to stand firm. Why? Because of all the outside distractions. Is anybody not distracted by life, by circumstances, by things going on around us? Are we not ever tempted to just give in to what we think is better, even though we know what is best? Are we not ever just tempted to say, I've had enough? I don't see God working, so I'm just going to quit. I don't see anybody getting saved, so I don't know if this is really real or not, which I've heard people say recently. You know, if God is really there, why isn't he answering more prayers? Paul urged Timothy, don't quit. Don't stop now. Don't listen to all these other doctrinal issues. You stay true to what you know is right. Why? I think Paul knew the power of the gospel. But one last verse in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. What did Paul say? For I am not ashamed of the what? Gospel. Stop right there. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. If we're not ashamed of the gospel, why don't we talk about it more? I want you to answer that in your own mind, your own heart. If you're not ashamed of it, well, say it's kind of like politics. You just don't talk about that in public. It's a private thing. It's an inner thing. We just don't talk about that in public. Really? Because that's what Jesus Christ said that we're supposed to do. To actually live it out. To speak the gospel with our life. And when God opens those opportunities to have the discernment, to take a step and to open our mouths, He says, I'm not giving you the spirit of fear, but of power and love and sound mind. He said, all power is given unto me, and you shall be my witnesses. He says, the Holy Spirit indwells you. We're the very thing that we are afraid to do. God says, I've empowered you to do and commanded you to do. And if we're not ashamed, then what is our excuse? Well, it's just private. I don't want to tick anybody off. I don't want to make them upset. I don't want them to turn their back on me and just not have any open door of conversation. I think we're worried about a lot of stuff that never happens. We really are. Am I saying that everybody's just going to accept it? No. But what did Jesus tell the disciples? If you're not accepted in this town, dust your feet off and go where? To the next one. So if somebody doesn't want it, I can't force it. I'm not planning on forcing it. I'm not going to, get, I'm not going to shove it down their throat. But I can look for opportunities in my everyday conversation to bring Jesus into the picture. He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the what? Power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. It's an opportunity for us to plant seed. That some will plant, some will water. And if God chooses, he gives the increase in his timing, right? I can't control that. But my job is not to control it. My job is to be obedient. Paul is urging Timothy to challenge the church to stay faithful to the doctrine that they know is truth. You see, most of us know far more, far more truth than what we're practicing, right? We know a lot more than what we're practicing. Can I just urge you, as Paul urged Timothy, don't quit. Don't stop. Let's see what God will do as we stay committed and faithful to him. Amen? And as a church, we need this challenge, right? We need to not give up. You say, well, we've been this way forever. You know, I mean, you know, we just don't seem to grow. or We just don't seem to get here or get there or do this or do that. The easiest thing in the world was just to say, well, I've had enough. That's easy. But it's not right. Don't quit. Don't stop until God says it's time. Let's pray.